wherever you're tuning in. Uh, this is the final session for today and one that I've been looking forward to for a while. We just completed the round one of our Pitch for Climate competition uh, in the session, uh, which was already quite amazing um, to hear from so many amazing startups. This is the second round now. And what is Pitch for Climate? This is an opportunity for early stage startups um, to uh, present and pitch to investors. And we have two exciting investors joining us in the minute. Uh, and the grand prize here is uh, you get lifetime membership to the Impact Hustlers community, which means access to mastermind groups with experienced founders, uh, um, sessions with um, uh, other founders and uh, introductions to investors, as well as regular events that we're hosting, uh, both virtually and across the globe. Um, and the last bit is uh, every founder usually appreciates uh, $250,000 full of discounts across all kinds of software services and solutions. So um, let's see who's going to take the grand prize. Uh, but let's start with um, introducing Margarita Skarku, partner at 2150, um, who actually brought somebody along to judge today, which is great. Introduce both of you, please. Uh, and then we'll go over to Dimitri in a second. Margarita, welcome. Thanks, Michael. Yes, I'm joined by my uh, little helper today as I'm, I'm tuning in from London and it's uh, almost 7 p.m. and her dad's running late. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll have That's an extra great. judge for the for this uh, for the setup today. So, what's so her, I'm what's her name? Uh, it's Cleo, and uh, Cleo. Okay, she's Perfect. a seasoned uh, Zoom uh, participant, as you can probably tell. Uh, so, I'm Margarita. I'm uh, part of the investment team at Twenty One Fifty. We're a climate tech fund focusing on urban sustainability. Um, I think uh, you may have met, heard from my colleague Jacob earlier today as well. <clears throat> Um, we focus on uh, hardware and software backed uh, companies, primarily around Series E stage, so, so sort of post traction existing products and, and really looking to scale. Amazing. Welcome. And next up is Dimitri Gershenson, uh, the co founder and CEO of Enduring Planet, uh, which is not your traditional venture fund. So, a quick intro to you, Dimitri. Yeah. Sure. And I also, you know, interestingly enough, my kiddo is also home today, even though she's supposed to be in preschool, although she is very mobile. So she has escaped um, and isn't joining me today. Uh, so thanks so much for, for having me. I'm, I'm, as Michael mentioned, I'm Dimitri. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Enduring Planet. Uh, we provide fast, flexible and founder friendly non-dilutive capital to climate entrepreneurs. Uh, we invest exclusively in the U.S. today. Um, and we have two products that we offer. So we have a revenue-based financing instrument for folks that are post-revenue and have some demonstrated growth and performance. And then we also offer an advanced product for folks that have state or federal grant funds that have been announced but not dispersed. So if you've recently won a Department of Energy grant, California Energy Commission grant, et cetera, and you don't want to wait the nine months to get the funding, uh, we can bridge that gap for you. And in less than 30 days. So really excited to take a look at, at these pitches today. And thanks again, Michael. Thank you. And the first pitch is from Will Weissman, uh, co-founder of Climatize, actually one of our community members. Great to see you, Will. Uh, we didn't get the chance to meet up last week, but it's good to have you here on stage. And uh, let's uh, kick it off with you if you share your screen and uh, go ahead. Sounds great. Thank you all. And, and greetings from a rainy morning here in, in California. So start here. Are you able to see my screen there, folks? Yes. Cool. Okay. Today, I don't want to talk to you about climate change. I don't want to talk to you about the hurricanes destroying our homes or the floods devastating our communities. Because you already know that problem. And that problem gives me anxiety every single day. What I do want to talk to you about it's how we put together $155 million of climate projects in our funding pipeline, and we're just getting started. I'm Will Wiseman, co-founder and CEO of Climatize. The story of Climatize starts in Barcelona in 2019, when my co-founder and I saw over 100,000 people protesting for climate action. We realized that we would all go home, and the next day, nothing would be different. We asked ourselves, what is it that everyone from that crowd could contribute? And we came up with the idea that almost everyone has a little bit of spare change. So enter Climatize. You can invest directly in profitable climate projects or just simply set it and forget it. 
With monthly auto investing and micro investments that use as little as a spare change from your everyday credit card purchases. Now you can earn a return for saving the world. And we take all the thinking out of climate action and make it accessible to all. So check this out. Here are all my investments from the past month. I can then search through our projects. And when I find one that I like, I can dig in a little bit. I can check the financials. And if I really like it, I can go and make a thousand dollar investment just like that. It's just that easy. We've, so, we've sourced $155 million of projects and joined a partnership with the Department of Energy. We've oversubscribed our beta release. And this month, when we receive FINRA approval on our application, we'll be launching our investment product to our growing waitlist. So far, our cool climate news has helped us grow organically and efficiently with a customer acquisition cost of just over $5. In parallel, we're developing relationships with community lenders who can serve as both acquisition channels and co-lenders. We monetize through a success fee and have reoccurring revenue through our loan servicing fee. In the future, our 16 sustainable brand partners will offer kickbacks to our investors' portfolios by spending at those brands. And then finally, we're gonna launch a climate card where every purchase adds to your portfolio. Each one of these products is a step towards our mission to make every transaction an investment in climate action. Climatize leverages two network effects. The more investors that we have, the closer to home and more relevant the projects will become. And then as we gather more data uh, in terms of spending behavior, we can offer you more relevant brands and incentives. As a team, we're uniquely positioned with experience designing, building and financing energy projects and we've scaled software products around the world. We're operating at the crossroads of the two largest and most profitable industries in the world, energy and finance. So if you wanna join us, we're fundraising to accelerate our growth. Our next round of funding will get us through this FINRA approval to 10,000 customers and a million dollars invested through our app. So when the next generation asks, what did you do about climate change? Make sure your answer is everything. Love it, Will. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll go to a quick Q&A. We have a few minutes for that. Um, who wants to go first with some questions or challenges? Uh, I'm happy to go, go first. Ahead. Thanks, Will. That was a, a great uh, presentation. I love the effort to democratize investing into this space. Um, mm -hmm. I have two questions. The first is super simple. How do you make money? And mm -hmm. um, the second may be a little bit more complicated, but would love to hear about the process to pick the projects that can be backed? How do you ensure that these are actually truly impactful? How do you monitor those on an ongoing basis without, without that becoming a huge part of, of the business and draining resources mm -hmm. away from the product? Sure, yeah. So um, with respect to the first one with the monetization, we take 5% of funds raised. So it's if it's a $5 million project, we can take 250K from that. Then depending upon the loan term, we have that loan servicing fee. So if it's, again, a 10-year term, we would take an additional 5% of that. That is charged to the project developer. So if you as an investor put in $1,000, you're earning your yield on $1,000. So the project developer needs to incorporate that into the soft costs of their project development. Then as we have more projects on the platform, we have that freemium model. So it's free for anyone and everyone to sign up. But if you want access to the higher yield projects, then there is a reoccurring subscription fee. We have a network of sustainable brand partners. They offer three to 7% of the basket value when you spend with them. An example is Earth Hero. They're like a sustainable Amazon alternative. If you use Climatize 15, you get 15% off of your spending there. So we can eliminate the green premium on sustainable products while you get a kickback to your portfolio and we monetize on that spending. Then after that, we'll be launching a climate card in which every transaction that you make has a kickback to your portfolio. So those micro investments are to the next level with that climate card. Does that help? Okay, perfect. And then for screening projects, 
we often take a first meeting with the project developer to get a sense of, you know, is there something here? You know, is there value? Do they understand kind of the product? Are they going to be able to actually develop this project? And where does it stand? So we've done business development for projects ranging from the project development phase through construction debt, as well as actually for refinancing existing projects. So with refinancing existing projects, it's considerably easier. You can actually see that project's performance in terms of energy generation. How is it performing from a financial perspective? If we're talking about the construction phase, we're going to go and look and say, you know, do they have the appropriate contracts in place? Are there the warranties? Uh, you know, what is the expected cash flows of this project? And then we're going to want to see about a 1.2x debt service coverage ratio of the expected uh, revenue generation from that project based on the loan that we're providing. Then additionally, we want to see, you know, is there the right of way um, easements? Do they have an interconnection permit if they're going to be doing then construction debt? We have a little bit more to work with there. If we're doing project development, then it means we have to really look at, you know, what is the track record of this developer? Um, you know, do they have three years of successful project development experience? You know, do they have any unexpected failures recently? What is kind of the credit worthiness of that project developer? So we're issuing debt notes to provide the CapEx for these projects. And it's worth just clarifying that, that we're not actually investing in the equity of the projects. We're providing generally more construction capital or pre-development capital. Do I have time for two quick questions? Absolutely. Or Absolutely. We'll, we'll try to keep them quick. So for me, these are kind of connected. You know, one, I'm, I'm trying to get a sense of the problem you're solving for these two distinct customer mm -hmm. segments, right? You have mm -hmm. developers on the one hand who you're offering this funding to. Um, mm -hmm. and, and on the other hand, you have retail consumers who are, interested in providing you money. So how, talk to me about your validation of understanding whether like demand beyond the beta signups. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. I think the, the second question I have is like, how do you ensure that you don't have adverse selection on the project side? And, and how do you keep mm -hmm. developers on your platform? The fee structure that you outlined is pretty expensive for project debt, especially once folks get mature. And so mm -hmm. how do you avoid just having like, people's first projects, many of which will probably fail on the platform, as opposed to having sort of like mature developers who come back to you for capital over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So what we've often heard is that from project developers, that they are developing these projects in kind of a sub $5 million range, 100% uh, on equity. So that's where being able to have some form of lending product enables them to be able to really stretch the, the returns of that project and be able to access capital that isn't purely off of their balance sheets. So that's been a reoccurring problem in which, you know, they say, look, commercial lenders generally want to hit that $50 million utility scale project. That's why we're developing also these relationships with community banks, because they can not only co-lend with us, they can kind of coast off of our diligence and we can provide them with deal flow within a space in which, you know, they may not have been underwriting these projects in the first place. Then uh, to your point around that selection bias. So that is not something that we've really experienced. I mean, some of our project partners that we've signed letters of intent with include Block Power, who are really highly credible project developers. And yet for them, there's an impetus to actually engage the communities to actually help participate and fund these projects. You create that virtuous cycle in a community instead of, say, the yield of these projects being siphoned off to Manhattan. And then additionally, particularly with project development capital, that's where we've heard reoccurring that it's a very difficult place for them to secure financing from kind of a traditional commercial lender. That's a slightly higher risk profile, but also a slightly higher return profile. You can get 10 to 13% APY on those notes, oftentimes six to call it 36 months to liquidate those. So with that, a traditional commercial lender would have a hard time being the single check onto that project development capital. Whereas in this model, you're distributing that over over, you know, call it 10,000, 15,000 investors who might be in for $5, $25, but can appreciate a really competitive yield on that note. Okay, thanks. Perfect. Thank you so much. Well, really uh, enjoyed the pitch. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, next up, we got Robert Luo uh, from Meet Hero. Uh, over to you, Robert. Uh, share your deck and let's go.
Perfect. You just got to unmute yourself, Robert, quickly. Great. There we go. Hi, guys. Do you know that you and your children are drinking and eating a credit card size of microplastic every single day? Microplastic is found everywhere in our life. It's even found in newborn babies. A lot of people don't know about this, but in the U.S., 20 billion of these PVA-wrapped microplastic pots are being created, and 8,000 tons of these PVA-made microplastic will flow into the ocean, come back as to, to the water we drink and the food we eat. It's one of the most urgent needed problem to be solved. Luckily, my company, Michero, has developed an innovative patented technology that can upcycle a variety of agriculture byproducts. Using our technology, we convert these byproducts into biopolymers that can be processed on the existing plastic manufacturing equipment, which can then be made into these seemingly thermal plastic resins and be applied for the final usage. Our material is USDA bio-based certified. Right here, I want to show you a quick clip on the process of our technology on existing plastic equipment. This machine is called Twin Screw Extruder. It's traditionally used to make plastic pellets and resins. And now, our technology can apply to these equipment. So there's no change required to existing plastic equipment to make an easy adoption for our manufacturing partners. Our material has possessed a high tensile strength elasticity it can create low oxygen permeability and block out fat and grease on the surface. When it's, once it's been made into film, it can be translucent and printable. We can also heat seal our material into different variety of applications that's been processed on existing plastic equipment. The commercial value of our application has reached $25 billion. It's a huge market. Not only can it be made into the pots you see right here, it can also be used for construction, real estate industries, used for cosmetic, adhesive, even as food additives. A lot of people don't know about this, but the contact lenses that people wear and the artificial, artificial eye drops that people apply have PVA inside. So our solution can also replace the PVA in pharmaceutical applications. We have developed a very unique and first of its kind partnership in which the Unilever and Anheuser-Busch and Bev have funded us to create the world's first 100% bio-based laundry and detergent pot made from beer waste. And here is Unilever's VP of Human Sandeep talking about our partnership. Our partnership with Mitero. Um, it's, it's a great partnership. You know, they're taking agricultural waste and converting into a protein uh, that can be used as a plastic replacement. So uh, yeah, this this... This is exciting. We're very excited about this once of its kind partnership and move into the next stage of our scaling. Now, learning from what we have done, we are creating a new process on top of already have. The process is very much like brewing beer that can scale up and lower the cost. We're designed bacteria that can intake different types of inedible biomass and even plastic waste. These bacteria and enzyme will break down into polymer that can be modified, grafted, engineered into the resins that you saw earlier. We're leveraging the power of precision fermentation and artificial intelligence to create a new category of PVA alternative biomaterials. We're facing enormous market potentials that most people don't know about. The PVA market has already reached $5 billion. By 2030, we aim to produce 100 million kilos on annual production for our early adopters. That's equivalent to $400 million in annual revenue. When we place our material and PVA side by side, you can see that our mechanical property has exhibited the same quality as PVA. What's even better is during the manufacturing process, we require 38% lesser energy um, carbon emission and 37% lesser energy. Once we reach commercial production level, we expect our cost to be 10 to 30% cheaper than PVA. It's a win-win situation for everybody. Here is a list of our clients that already purchased our materials, have signed the pilot, and have signed a letter of interest with us. This year, we have captured 66 interested customers, and now we have an annual production capacity of 10,000 tons that we have started supplying to our partners and clients. 
Branding and visibility is very important to us. Because of our unique technology, we have been featured in more than 30 international awards, have been also been covered on Forbes, Bloomberg, TechCrunch, and these well-known publications. And we want to educate people about the importance of replacing microplastic in our daily life. We have a team Thank of you, Robert. Please wrap up. Yeah, we have a team of PhDs, serial entrepreneurs, and experienced production managers. I have started three companies with two acquisitions. Our team has a collected years, um, collected of 50 years experience in R&D, scalability, and commercialization. And we expect to reach a commercial production level of 10 million tons, 10 million kilos by 2028, in which we decide to license and outsource our technology so it can scale up globally. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, we'll hand over to questions. Uh, who wants to go first on questions? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe I'll go first this time. I, I, I'm trying to understand. I mean, it seems like the product's cheaper. Um, it's better. It performs better. It's less polluting. Um, what's the... What's the catch? What's like complicated about this? Where are the places where you think you'll struggle the most in the next few years? Mm -hmm. um, fairly speaking, we're not cheaper today. We will be cheaper when we reach commercial production level. Um, but our profit margin as of today is between 30 to 40%, which is pretty good. And obviously we are thinking about ahead. How can we produce? How can we scale up? And that's why we're leveraging the existing infrastructure equipment so we can apply directly with our partners and scale up quickly. And we're also working on the part where we can quickly ferment it, um, the polymer at a lower cost in the long run that can apply to different applications beyond the pots that we're starting off with. I have some other questions with me. I'll let Margarita go. Thanks, thanks Dimitri and thanks Robert. Uh, yeah, super, super exciting. Um, and I have loads of questions. Maybe I'll start with competition. So I've seen quite a few businesses that are doing something similar. Um, I mean, to Dimitri's point, I haven't seen any of them take off and overtake plastics yet. And I, and I wonder why, given the focus and money going in to that. So I'd love to understand what, what you feel makes you different and how you're positioned to really win a, a big part of this market share. Yes, please allow me to make a correction. There's nothing similar like ours. The, the bioplastic that you're looking at are more on hydrophobic applications. For example, POA, PHA, seaweed, starch, chitosan. They all hydrophobic applications. We're focusing on hydrophilic applications that is looking to replace PVA. So we are in fact the only one in the space that's working on bio-based PVA solution, according to Unilever not for my own words. So this that gives us a huge opportunity to capture this market once for all. And we have already been supplying our solution to our partners that have verified, validated the mechanical property of our solution. Now we're looking to scale up with them. Maybe I can piggyback on that then. Um, can, can you say a bit more, coming back to your TAM, yeah. Um, sort of slide. There's a lot in there about single use plastic, but it doesn't actually sound like you're solving the single use plastic problem. You're solving the hydrophilic single use plastic problem. So how, how big is that market? Is that the $5 billion dollar number? PVA, that's $5 billion. Okay. Got it. All right. Any last question, pressing question? Uh, we can still allow that. That's fine. Yeah question so it seems to me as if at some point you're going to have to tap into bioreactor capacity uh to be able to produce at mass scale is that something you see as a as a barrier um right. <laughs> they're, they're, so essentially depend on the end applications we have two generations of a technology they're working on the gen one which is the resins that you see right here it does not require any bioreactor it's a chemical process where extract purify modify and that lives exists on the existing machines, no battery reactor needed. And the precision fermentation platform, that's more where we're going to the polymerization for pharmaceutical, for cosmetic type of applications. And we are developing and have developed partnership with Enhazer Bishop Bev. And they are able to give us 
or let us use their fermenters, bioreactors, when we scale up and they'll potentially also become our investors in the future. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, judges, please make sure to submit your uh, feedback uh, through the Google Forum. Thanks, Robert. Really appreciate you joining us and taking your time. Uh, we're waiting for one more startup founder to actually join us, but we have another one in line. Uh, hopefully, Emily, if she can join us afterwards, we would love to hear her pitch still. But uh, for now, we'll go with Jack, uh, the founder of Earthmark. Over to you, Jack. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for having me. Um, and I will try and fill in for uh, for Emily as best as I can, and uh, maybe she'll join us straight afterwards. Um, so let me just present. Bear with me, sorry. Okay, it should be on its way through. Uh, let me know if you can see this. Yeah, got it, let's go. Great, sorry about that, um, that wait. Cool, um, I'm Jack, I'm the CEO and co-founder at Earthmark um, to introduce what we do. So first of all, uh, we're looking at the landscape, which was very much along the same lines of uh, what Will started us off on, which was this general frustration that uh, people are well aware of the problem um, of the climate crisis, but all too frustrated of what they can do to contribute. Uh, we look at the left hand side of, of this and we can see that most consumers, most people are willing to spend more on a service or a product that is sustainable. Um, there's regulations coming into place uh, across the whole of the EU and also uh, companies operating in the U EU as well, uh, as well as into the US. Uh, which will make companies um, and make it uh, a legal requirement for companies to declare their non-financial disclosures, so their emissions. Um, and then if we look on the right, we have this view of how people tend to buy and compare products and services. And that is largely based off a, a review-based economy. So what does all of this mean? Well, when we look at, um, as a consumer, where I want to uh, be able to buy products that are sustainable, um, to be willing to spend more on these as well, uh, this is what I'm faced with. So a complete head fry of eco labels, certifications, authorities and bodies. Um, and by the time it comes to me choosing uh, which item to buy, uh, which company I might want to be associated with, whether that be uh, job seeking or uh, booking a restaurant or going to a hotel, uh, we're faced with all of these different uh, bodies and labels. Uh, what does all of this mean? Introducing Earthmark. Uh, we started uh, two years ago, we started as a direct-to-consumer business. Uh, we pivoted uh, to B to B to C. Um, and essentially what we do is look at uh, the verified bodies and eco-labels that already exist, um, the likes of B Corp, S&P Global, um, and some of these uh, publicly available data uh, that already exist for companies uh, of all sizes. We aggregate all of this data uh, and we bring it together into one view. Uh, and this is where Earthmark really looks at these three pillars. So we look at uh, the environment um, and the performance of a company today, not what they're just saying they're going to do in a few years time. Uh, so we look at factors such as carbon intensity, uh, some easier to find than others. Um, we look at governance and transparency. So do they declare uh, their emissions today? Are they clear in their reporting? Um, and we look at business information. So their size, their industry, um, and their physical footprint. We bring all of this together into one view and we create a zero to five score. What we then do is integrate these scores into uh, software platforms, third party uh, partners and marketplaces where people typically buy, compare, invest and rent. Here are just a few examples of how this is used in practice. So uh, as a user, you could filter according to a brand's view uh, and their earthmark that's associated to them. 
Uh, in the middle, this is actually a live uh, use case, which is with uh, our first partner, uh, Kindred. They operate a cashback extension uh, so people can buy and browse on their uh, phone browser just as they usually would. They would land on a brand site um, and then this extension would pop up to show uh, the brand's earthmark, as well as in this case, the ability to gain cash back as well, which is delivered from Kindred. Um, and on the right hand side here, just in the same way that today you can uh, base your decision based on uh, trust and popularity uh, to also be able to base it on a business environmental performance. Why would partners want to partner with Earthmark and include this in their site? Uh, first of all, to reduce dropout and increase conversion. Secondly, to save users time and effort doing their own research. We know that people are looking for this. Um, and so if we can stop people opening up tabs and doing their own research, then uh, we can keep them within the same customer journey. Um, and thirdly, to speed up the transition to a more sustainable economy. Here is the feature that I mentioned uh, before with our first launch partner, Kindred and O2, uh, which launched in April this year. Uh, two stats uh, to draw out from this. So there's now been over 25,000 users of this feature, which is called Feel Good Shopping. Uh, people can, uh, as I mentioned, go on their browser, visit different brand sites and, and see the earthmark, the environmental performance of this brand. Uh, from this project already, we've seen that 60% of the top brands, uh, which is uh, defined as those that are most popular uh, in terms of spend with users, uh, have earthmarks. And then 21% higher conversion rate for brands with earthmarks versus those without, which really shows the, uh, the need for transparency. Our business model uh, is B2B to C. Uh, we offer a free setup, so no cost involved when we um, basically get the brands from our partners um, and present back the Earthmark. And we base this on a monthly transaction dependent on the number of brands that we uh, present back to our partners. Our team is made up of a mix of product um, and partner enthusiasts. Myself and Laura met at O2 working with startups um, and helping them plug into different corporates. Uh, Ollie is our sustainability uh, expert, worked across Climate Kick. Uh, is currently a consultant at EY um, and ran the sustainability practice at Heineken. Uh, Anastasis is our CTO, um, actually set up Greece's first data uh, tech for good startup. And we have a mix of advisors from uh, Sweatcoin through to Lime and Stanford Startex. Traction so far, uh, we've been through Climate Kick's top UK green business ideas. Uh, Carbon 13's Venture Builder uh, cohort member. Uh, we're in the Green Tech Alliance. Uh, our first partner is Kindred and O2. Um, and on the right, some of the figures uh, I've mentioned throughout the pitch. That is Earthmark. Um, apologies for the, uh, the shaky start getting the slide started. Um, no worries. So. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jack. And over to Dimitri and Margarita for any questions. Who wants to go first this time? Dimitri, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, fa fascinating. Thank you for for sharing. Uh, I'd love to get a sense of. I mean, I'm 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 guessing you're like thinking about VC capital for this type of product, and so talk to me a little bit about sort of comparable models that exist in the market that generate venture scale returns. And then that's one question. And then the other that I have is is sort of around navigating customer acquisition. There, see, like I would imagine there's a kind of an agency problem in this model where you're selling to the marketplace or the the, the, the store front, uh, but the benefit accrues to the brands, not necessarily to the storefront. And and so like, how do you, how do you navigate that? How do you really clearly, what's the specific value to the, to the intermediary that you're selling to? And, yeah. and are you actually generating additional transactions that, you know, provide enough given the cost and the complexity that you're adding to the process. Yeah, sure. So, uh, yeah, so taking the first one. So, uh, we look, uh, I guess across the board at the likes of a uh, good shopping guide and good on uh, where we see there have been attempts at aggregating this sort of information before. Um, I think there's various ways that we've seen, uh, it doesn't work so much. So one of the blockers that we've seen is with those sort of forums, there's still a dependency on people saying, you know, I want to buy something, I want to look for something, I want to look for a new job. And uh, it's assumed that they it would be their thought process to go to that set place, for example, a good shopping guide, 
and then from there base their decision on what brand to then operate with and um, interact with. It's very much our belief that we need to plug into existing customer journeys, whether that's investing, borrowing, buying, uh, or job seeking. So we look at those uh, similar models and we think that's really how we'd sort of uh, differentiate that one. Um, in terms of the financial returns and I guess the, the investment side of it, um, there's been, uh, I guess, direct to consumer attempts at this as well, uh, whereby uh, you would be able to sort of pay for the certifications and then rely on a business to actually present this back to their customers. Um, and again, there's a reason that we've uh, gone down this third party route is to try and get into these um, places where they already have the existing customers and brands. Um, the value add to these intermediaries, um, I touched on the sort of increase in uh, conversion um, and reduction of dropouts. Um, there's also from the conversations we've had, um, you know, an interest in adding more value. So they don't want to just be providing cashback deals or affiliate links or, um, you know, the same job offer that exists on different sites. Um, these intermediaries are also keen to sort of uh, add another value and asset um, to their platform as well. And if they can help their users um, understand, you know, the environmental performance of these brands, instead of having to drop out and do their own research, um, that seems to be landing really well. Thanks. Margaret, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, a few questions. I think my main one is what are the key inputs to produce the score and then the process? And what types of products or services can you currently rate accurately? Because I guess you, you know, you've mentioned jobs, you've mentioned sort of physical products. To my mind, rating uh like a food item versus rating a job, sure. being able to use this same framework seems challenging. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Yeah, so so thanks for the question. Um, so we've started off at a, a brand level um, and a parent company level at that as well. So um, we've really done that for the key reason that it's, it's all too easy at the minute because of greenwashing that we know uh, all too well about to uh, go out with, you know, a line of clothing or a specific brand underneath the big umbrella company, um, which kind of tries to distract from the overall impact. Uh, so we've started at you know, the brand and the parent company level. That enables us to get a lot of publicly available data from uh, either their own private company reports, some are better than others at disclosing that before these regulations come in, um, but also gives us the ability to be able to look at these, um, you know, on uh, company directory sites and existing um, third party sites as well that um, are verified sources to to look at, you know, emissions disclosure, um, the governance and the transparency of those already. Um, specifically, we look at um, carbon intensity as one of the key metrics. Um, that is something that enables us to be very sort of relative and to be able to compare apples with apples. Um, one of the challenges we wrestled with early on was to say, there's going to be more data for a company that's you know large and listed uh, versus the shop down the road. Um, so in that sense as well, you know there's certain answers to that. Some go down the B Corp process, for example, um, but we can also start to make some estimations based off the size of that business. How many stores do they have? How many employees? Um, and that's really been something we wrestle with. But as we look ahead, the product and the transaction level data is something that we intend to bring in. Um, but that's very much on our roadmap. Um, so really, to yeah, to summarise, it's brand and parent company at this stage, um, and it is cross sector. So there's no sort of um, restriction on that. And, and have you built some sort of model that pulls in data, like is there some sort of tech powering that, or is that on the roadmap? Very, very brief yeah. answer, please, as we need to wrap yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, brief. we have. Is that brief enough, Michael? <laughs> we have this oh, perfect uh, technology. Um, <laughs> yeah, we've 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 built that tech. Yeah. Great, thanks. Perfect. I'll let you guys get a touch afterwards if you'd like. Um, perfect. Uh, we have found Emily. I'm so excited. Uh, it's good uh, to have you join, Emily. Sorry for any tech trouble, uh, but it's good to have you on stage. Um, Emily is the um, founder of Valis, and welcome to the stage. Over Thank to you. you so much. Thank you. Yeah, apologies for those technical difficulties, but very glad to to be here. Let me just. Oh, 
Alrighty. Hello, everyone. My name is Emily Molstead. I'm CEO and co-founder of Ballas, a B2B software startup dedicated to delivering the software solutions that are needed to enhance metal recycling. There's a pressing need to reduce emissions for metal production while meeting growing demand. Recycling is a major pathway towards more sustainable production, but recycling inefficiencies are resulting in significant loss of material and value globally. In 2019, we conducted extensive industry interviews to determine what solutions are needed to fill this gap and achieve a circular economy. What we found is that material moves through the value chain from your collection yard to your processing facility to remelting through to manufacturers for reutilization. But key material and process data is stuck within a fragmented ecosystem. Information on the material availability, quality and value is lost post-processing or is siloed by stakeholders. Human decision-making cannot keep up with the dynamic nature of scrap material and all this information. Valis is tapping into this wealth of underutilized information by integrating with sensor-based technology and a variety of data sources to deliver real-time material tracking, process optimization, and data-driven decision-making that supports the profitability, stability, and sustainability of metal recycling. Our first product line is targeted at scrap processors who shred and soar end of life material like your old car. Insufficient sorting is resulting in $1.4 billion in lost potential revenue for these companies. This is because they lack the process visibility needed to maximize material recovery and product quality. They're processing millions of pounds of material and they're not having that, that sight into exactly what material they have, what's going into their waste stream and how they should be adjusting their processing. Our first product, Valasort, plugs in directly with high-tech sortation equipment, ties in key external data sources and leverages proprietary machine learning models. With Valasort, plant managers can access insights delivered from our cloud-based platform from the comfort of their air-conditioned office, which is really critical in a lot of locations. They can view trends in the scrap stream content, monitor product quality in real time, and make adjustments to their processing schedule to capture high value material that would normally enter their waste stream. These insights delivered through our platform yield significant returns on investment. We distinguish ourselves from the status quo and from other software solutions in the space which are focused on digitalizing of logistics or transactions by focusing on what drives all decision-making across the value chain, the material quality and the value. We're the first software platform to connect plant operations directly to management and sales. Ballast technology can be sold through equipment manufacturers as a bundled product. We're in the process of negotiating a sales uh, partnership with a global, global leading equipment manufacturer or it can be sold directly to plants by retrofitting previously installed equipment. Our pricing includes a one-time integration fee and an annual software subscription to access our platform. Since 2019, we've secured grants from the National Science Foundation to build out our MVP. We're now entering pilot scale demonstration at two separate scrap processing locations, one of which is a paid pilot. Our developments have garnered significant industry traction, including world leading R&D partnerships and product market fit validation through more than 150 stakeholder interviews. Within the next five years, we'll expand our product line to include solutions for collection yards and melt facilities to service a $6.5 billion global market. We've already secured non-dilutive funding through the Department of Energy to begin development of artificially intelligent and sensor-based solutions for melt facilities. This technology is highly transfer transferable to support the increased sustainability of ferrous recycling, as well as mining. With new product lines and expansions into new markets, we'll achieve $85 million in annual recurring revenue by 2027. Ballas is led by myself as CEO, my CTO and co-founder Caleb Ralphs and, product, and our product director, Ben Longo. We combine our unique expertise in material science and machine learning to drive innovative solutions. As a team, we've secured early non-dilutive funding needed to scale our technology from proof of concept to piloting. 
We've also completed a number of accelerator programs, including the 2022 Mass Challenge US Early Stage. Our growth in technology is backed by our board member, Sean Kelly, a recognized expert in light metal recycling. We're actively raising a seed round to support the completion of our piloting efforts and early sales, including in addition to growing our team of um, software engineers, integration engineers, and bringing on a sales manager. Together, we're building Vallis to be a leader in data science for a circular economy. Thank you, and I'll take any questions. Thanks so much, Emily. Uh, over to questions. Margarita, you want to go first? Don't sure. Know. There um, we go. Thanks, Emily. Really glad you could join us. Um, Happy to be here. Could you just repeat what the product that you're offering today is? It's a combination of machine learning that is equipment agnostic and a dashboard? Yep, so what we've developed is a platform that integrates directly with sorting equipment. So we don't provide the sensors or the sortation technology, but instead what we do is we capture the data that those systems are generating to then feed into our proprietary machine learning models that then provide insights through our platform. So essentially the user can go into our platform, can see the full breakdown of their process flow, the quality of material as it's moving through their, their process flow and get insights onto how they can be optimizing um, their sortation. And that quality of materials, if you don't, so you're not using like cameras or kind of image processing. So the sorting systems themselves have that information. And so okay. we're, we're getting the, the, the data and the information from those sorting systems. Okay. Okay. Thank you. This might seem like a silly question, but I, I'm trying to figure out how defensible this model is, right? So you're, you're using hardware that's provided by other folks who have their own software, which also does sorting, which I imagine they can like improve over time. Um, I would bet when they sell their hardware, there's some lockup on how long people need to use the SaaS products. If they want to switch, they have to like wait to work with you. Um, to, I, I, how, like, talk to me a little bit more about the defensibility of the model and sort of like how you maintain that edge over time and, and what the sort of long-term view is for, for your role in this market. Yeah, absolutely. So to, to clarify the software solutions that the equipment providers, um, deliver is primarily related to, you know, this is the specific metrics of the sorting system. You know, if there's a, a jam or, or some sort of issue with a belt, um, but it's not providing those macro trends and insights across the entire process. So they're not able to tie into an understanding of purchasing data, inventory information. Um, they're really just locked in on the, the sorting system and the, those sensor, uh, the sensor data that it generates. Um, and they're really focused on enhancing the sorting efficiency. So they have computers on, on those systems, um, but they're limited on how much they can process that data without introducing any latency because they need to make sort decisions on a, a millisecond basis. And so we're allowing the, that capture of the data, the uh, expanded processing of that data that their systems can't, can't handle and frankly can't connect to the entire workflow. Maybe I'll... I'll maybe I need to understand this a bit better, but if they're, if they worry about latency, I imagine you, you would as well. So how, how do you, how does your product then have an impact on sorting if you're not necessarily affecting the sorting in the moment? What, so like, we what don't, am I missing here? So we don't impact the, the piece by piece sortation. Instead, it's the day-to-day -day decision making. So we understand the material that they have coming into their plant floor we can make recommendations that, you know, based on current material availability or market trends that they should actually be um, sorting for a brass package rather than a copper package. Um, or then understanding the what's entering their waste stream or that mixed fraction that's remaining after sortation to provide insights on, you know, hey, actually you have significant stainless steel material that's remaining and it would be profitable for you to reprocess that and recover that material. Got it. Okay. All right. That that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Great questions. That, 
Thank you so much, Emily. Really appreciate your time and also appreciate the time of Dimitri and Margarita. I'll let you complete the feedback form. And just for all the founders that were pitching, we will be announcing the winners tomorrow and obviously email you as well with the results. Um, so you will hear from us. Um, wow, this has been a long day. Uh, I hope you really enjoyed it. Um, I did certainly um, really enjoy it today. We covered such a range, wide range of topics um, from really getting a sense of the ecosystem and the biggest trends in climate tech from Sophie. Uh, we covered the funding landscape and what we should actually aim for. Should we just aim for the gigacons or should we uh, um, be a little bit more flexible on the kind of climate solutions that we need to fund to uh, get us uh, out of this mess? Um, we covered funding quite a bit. We co covered talent, uh, a massive stream uh, this afternoon as well um, on sessions on how you can actually be part of the solution. If you're not already a founder in this space, if you're in a corporate or in a non-climate career, it's time for you to join the career and you've learned about Terra.do and Climate Base as uh, some key resources amongst others um, uh, to take care of that. Um, thanks everybody for joining us. Um, I also want to thank Jordan and the uh, Visualizing Ideas team uh, behind the scenes. Um, they really make 99% of this happen. I just show up for these sessions. So thanks uh, very much, everyone. Uh, make sure that you join us tomorrow. We have another full day of programming tomorrow. Uh, you can review the schedule here in hop in and select the sessions that you would like to join. And also, again, a big thank to our partner, 1014, uh, based in New York City. Um, check out their website, 1041014.nyc, uh, to learn more about the events. And then if you'd like further support, if you're a founder and you crave connections to other founders and would like to participate in pitching sessions like this and join sessions going forward, uh, we do have the Impact Hustlers community as well that you can join and you can actually join for free month. Uh, I will share that link in the chat if you like. So uh, without further ado, we'll, um, we'll close the day today. I hope to see many of you tomorrow again. And thanks everybody for joining today.